Finally tonight, one woman who proves age is just a number. CBS's Steve Hartman goes on the road with a 103-year-old lobster woman who shows no signs of stopping. Max Oliver is an old salt, but to his crewmate on this lobster boat, Max is but a child, her child. As we first reported a couple years ago, then 101-year-old Virginia Oliver was Maine's oldest lobster fisherman. Three days a week, May through November, you could find Virginia out here on Penobscot Bay, tackling one of the most hazardous jobs in the country. Have they ever gotten you? Oh, of course. <laughs> Once she got cut so badly, she needed seven stitches. And the doctor said to me, what are you out there lobstering for? Good question. And I said, because I want to. I think he might have thought that was a little too dangerous for somebody well, of your age. I don't care what he thought. Well, clearly. Yeah. <laughs> Virginia had been lobstering on and off since the age of seven. She used to go out with her father. It was man's work then, not another girl in sight. But nine decades later, she was the master of the sea. After Max hauled in the traps, Virginia measured the lobsters, Don't go on. tossed out the small ones, I throw it away. and then tamed the claws of the keepers. Who's the boss out there? I am. <laughs> she won't give up. What would she say if you said, oh, I'm ready to retire? You better have something wrong with you. You better have something wrong with you. It's been two years since our visit and I'm happy to report that almost nothing has changed. Later this month, at the age of 103, Virginia will begin her 95th lobstering season. There's a children's book now, and she's gained some celebrity, but Virginia remains the same humble lobster woman with the same retirement plan. When I die. When you die. Yeah. <laughs> In other words, no time soon. Steve Hartman on the road in Rockland, Maine. Finally tonight, Harvard Law School is considered to be one of the most prestigious academic institutions in the world. CBS's Steve Hartman introduces us to one of its newest graduates on the road. No one has ever attended Harvard Law School for its sparkling glass doors or smudge-free countertops. In fact, Support staff here say most students never even notice their efforts, with one remarkable exception. He says, I just want to give you a hug and, you know, say hi to you. They say one day, this one student started thanking all of them. Thank you for what you do. And this is something very different. I'm like, what is this kid's angle? Food service worker Brion Merchant was skeptical. Before that, but once I heard his background, that's when it just all made sense. I'm like, oh, <laughs> you see us because you're one of us. Mm -hmm. For sure. That student is Rehan Staten. Before coming to Harvard Law, he worked in sanitation. My job was to refurbish the dumpsters. I've heard people literally point to me and point to my coworker and say, like, don't be like them. I think it just reminds me to stay humble and um, just remember I wasn't always standing here. Today, Rehan has not only maintained his humility, he has multiplied it. Earlier this year, Rehan started a nonprofit called the Reciprocity Effect. Its mission? To guarantee that from now on and forever, the support staff here at Harvard Law would not only be seen, they would be celebrated. This was the first support staff awards banquet, honoring in Oscar-like fashion, the custodians and cafeteria workers and everyone else who makes this place possible. The feeling of knowing that you are appreciated will always go a long way, especially for those who don't know that. I think that's what makes what Rahan did so special is because you didn't even realize how unseen you were until you were seen. And then all of a sudden you're like, oh, this is kind of nice. Rahan Staten. In the coming days, a lot of graduates will stand high on a stage, a great vantage point to finally see all the people who lifted them there. <laughs> Steve Hartman on the road in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Finally tonight, sometimes the smallest gestures can have the biggest impact on someone else's life. CBS's Steve Hartman found such a story on the road. 
A few years ago, Melody Morrow of New York City hurt her foot and needed physical therapy. But she says what really made her feel better was paying the bills. You asked for a receipt. Correct. And it comes in the mail. Correct. And what was special about it? On the envelope, on the front of the envelope, it had these little music notes. Her name is Melody, but this is a big health system. Personal touches on billing statements aren't typically their thing. And then it began. Every month thereafter, her payment receipt arrived in the mail. And every month, a new drawing. They started out simple, like this treble clef. But as the months progressed, the envelopes got more and more elaborate. And this was original art, created anonymously just for her. It's hard to even describe. It was incredible. Melody did call her provider, MJHS Health System, and asked if by chance there was anyone in the billing department who was artistic. She says the phone got quiet, and then she heard, hey, Emily, it's for you. I'm like, uh oh, what I do now? What were you hoping was going to come from this? I like to make people happy. Accounting clerk Emily Margolis is hardly a frontline caregiver, but she says she can still make people better, and her drawings are her way. Melody was so grateful, Emily decided to ramp up her game even further. <laughs> she began taking Melody's mailings home at night and spent hours turning those plain white business envelopes into masterpieces. Then I started adding rhinestones. <laughs> I know I got involved with the gold leaf. That was fun. I had never <laughs> done that leaf. before. Yeah. Where was this going to stop? I, I know how much she had left to pay. <laughs> <laughs> this was the last mailing, but not the end of the story. Hello. Mwah. Melody and Emily became friends and are now co-curators of an exhibit at this Manhattan coffee shop, showcasing Emily's enveloping creations. Although Melody says what's really on display here is the healing power of kindness. This was a stranger, and she was doing that just for me. And that's the beauty of it. A note of harmony. Steve Hartman on the road in New York. This week, CBS's Steve Hartman goes on the road with the story of a nurse and the life-saving treatment of compassion. At Community Hospital North in Indianapolis, newborn intensive care nurse Katrina Mullen has a reputation for going above and beyond. But as you'll soon see, the lengths she went to for these triplets and their 14-year-old mother is beyond compare. Oh, being that age and having all three babies premature and sick was going to be a hard road for her. Katrina was once a teenage mother herself, and she knew that this young mom, Shariah Small, didn't have a stable home life. So, even after the babies were discharged, Katrina continued to visit them and shower them with gifts. Pacifiers or bottles, three matching outfits for them. <laughs> um, <laughs> what is driving you to do all this? Just love. I mean, I loved her, I loved them, and I just wanted to see her be a successful parent. She was just there. She was there emotionally, she was there physically, she was there mentally. Which was all new for Shariah. Yeah. She was really the only person there. But Shariah still didn't have a proper home for the kids. So eventually, the Department of Child Services intervened. They began looking for a foster family, or more like multiple foster families, because finding one place for a teenage mother and her triplets would be nearly impossible. And that's when Shariah got a text message that simply said, I can't wait for you to come home. Never mind that Katrina already had five kids of her own. What color is that? She took on these other four pop, pop. without giving it a second pop, thought. Pop, pop, pop. It's been exhausting. Uh oh It's been crazy and busy. Yeah. Oh! But I've never once sat and said, I wish I hadn't done this. But that seems illogical. You just listed a bunch of reasons <laughs> why this is a terrible idea. And then you I say, I would absolutely do it again. I would absolutely do it again. In fact, just a few months ago, Katrina adopted Shariah, 
who just finished high school and now plans to go to college. All thanks to the nurse who went above and beyond and beyond some more. Steve Hartman on the road in Indianapolis. Finally tonight, CBS's Steve Hartman goes on the road to America's heartland where the people live up to the name. If there was ever an election in this country for kindest American, the people of Galveston, Indiana know who they'd nominate. Because I think he's out there to help everybody. That's what he's known for. He just always has been. It's the cloth he's cut from. Just a special guy, very special guy. So who is this great humanitarian who lifts up the people of Galveston? The same man who puts them down. Meet 89-year-old gravedigger Alan McCloskey. Alan has been at this job since 1952 and refuses to retire because he says a new gravedigger might not square the corners as precisely, might not care as deeply for all those loving souls. Yeah. People that we went to school with and worked with. And what was your hardest one? It was my wife. How'd you get through that? I figured she'd want me to do it. Alan and Barbara had three kids, but his definition of family extends well beyond blood, which may explain why a good chunk of the town gathered recently for what Alan thought was someone else's birthday party but was really a celebration of him. At the party, he got an official Guinness World Record for longest career as a grave digger, 70 years and counting. But more importantly, he was recognized for the thousands of odd jobs he's done for people. It's his side hustle, but with a twist. We'd ask Alan for a bill and he wouldn't give us a bill. Never get a bill. Uh, you know, I'll send you a bill. He said, I'll just catch up with you later. And then later never came. You, you never hear you never hear anything more about it. It was the running joke at his party. Anybody in here still waiting on him to send you a bill for work this year? <laughs> yeah, that's what I thought. I did ask Alan about this. They say they can't get a bill from you. Oh. But all I got <laughs> was a hearty <laughs> laugh. <laughs> Alan McCloskey, unassuming by profession and persona, but also a bold beacon for anyone in search of meaning. Alan has figured out what life is about. It's not the money that makes him happy. I truly believe Alan has figured out where enough is at. He's found enough. And strange thing about finding enough, you often end up with more than enough. Steve Hartman on the road in Galveston, Indiana. CBS's Steve Hartman heads to New England for a real life Queen's Gambit on the road. The students at Weatherby Elementary in Hampton, Maine seem peaceful enough, but start a war on this turf. And these rookies with their night moves become a royal pawn in the chess to anyone who dares try to dethrone their king which is how they became the new Maine State Chess Champions. It was so, like, exciting. Everybody was cheering. Just, like, feels like you could fly. A special, like, one in a million. In fact, the only thing more unlikely than their success is where they found it. Here, in the broom closet. School custodian David Bishop used to play chess as a kid. So when, years later, he found himself cleaning the hall outside the Weatherby Chess Club, he says he felt drawn, like he had to be part of it. And at the time, I, I didn't really have any thought of how to teach. I'd never done that before. I didn't really think he had a good background like, for doing it, but he obviously does. His name is Mr. Bishop, which is pretty cool. He took over. And? And here we are. <laughs> Five minute game. Where they are, is a community of intensely focused little minds who play like a real kingdom is at stake. What happens is, yes, there's an attack here. And although no one here is a master. The king's coming out way too early. Right? Mr. Bishop has convinced every last one of them that they have the potential. What I tell them is, if you love it, you're gonna be better than the top player we have. They say, no, that can't be. Yes, if you love it, you'll never give up and you're gonna get better and better. 
as the months and years go by. Sometimes we make the mistake of thinking our job descriptions are a box, confining who we are and what we do. But David Bishop sees it differently. He says when they told him to make this school shine, they never said how. I found my purpose. Steve Hartman on the road. It's a lesson learned. Near Bangor, Maine. We send our kids to school in hopes they receive a good education. In this week's On the Road with Steve Hartman, we learned that lessons in kindness are also worth studying. Not long ago, I made a surprise visit to the Alhambra Traditional School in Phoenix. And although I anticipated a warm welcome, I was completely unprepared. Hello, class. For this. I mean, good gosh. It's not like I'm the rock. I'm a lump. But our connection clearly runs deep, thanks to Mr. Derek Brown. As we first reported last month, for more than a decade, Mr. Brown has been showing his fifth graders one of my stories every day. How do you justify it? If nothing else matters, math, English, reading, writing, nothing matters if the kids aren't grounded and good. And to that end, I knew I was gonna get a hug. He says the Americans we meet on the road hug game. teach character oh. better than he ever could. It's just to make you like a better person. And how's it working? It was working good. It made me more nicer to my little brother. It made you nicer yeah. to your little brother. Yeah, I mean, I was. I consider nice. my career a success. Yeah, <laughs> it is a success. And this isn't just happening in Phoenix. Over the years, we've learned of other teachers across the country bringing on the road into the classroom. Here are just some of the schools we knew about, but have always assumed there were thousands of others. Which is why, to bring them all together, to share lesson plans and strategies, we started a Facebook group called Kindness 101 for Teachers. And so far, more than 30,000 teachers have joined, creating a mini movement. But there's always room for more. So if you know a teacher who might be interested, Mr. Brown says, please tell them about it. They have to let their kids see this. Kids have to connect to these. My stomach hurts, Mr. Brown. No, it doesn't. You're feeling. Lights, please. And when that happens, he says the possibility opens wide for kids to go from watching goodness to emulating it. I'd like to see him act it out. So then maybe one of my kids could be the topic of one of your stories. That would be the ultimate. For both of us. Steve Hartman, On the Road, in Phoenix. It's Friday, and that means On the Road. This week, Steve, CBS's Steve Hartman takes us out to the ball game. At a baseball game, where most young fans want nothing more than to meet a real player, this kid, Vincent Steele, stands alone. What's up, man? Vincent idolizes umpires. It's something that we're not really used to, you know, so every fan we can get is a plus. You know, last night uh, there was a time somebody said, put the kid in. <laughs> As we first reported in 2018, Pat. Vincent was such a fan of umpires, every game he became one. Stood in the front row at the Carolina Mudcat Stadium near Raleigh, mimicking their moves. <laughs> He got so into character, even the manager took him seriously, coming over to report a lineup change. Zero. Initially, we thought maybe it was like a little bit of a phase type of thing. These like are his parents. It's a two-year phase at this point. I don't point. know. <laughs> <laughs> and they say it wasn't just at the stadium. At home, he would stand in front of the TV and do the same routine. He slept next to baseballs autographed by umpires. He even visited an umpire school where he learned the proper way to call a strike, which apparently isn't to say strike. What umpires say, hoit. Why do they say hoit? That's what they all do. What is out? Out. Okay, ball is? Ball. Strike is? <laughs> I think he wanted to throw me out of this interview. <laughs> Wait, what is the deal? It's been four years since we first told this story, and the only thing that has changed is the venue. Vincent now works real Little League games. <laughs> Tops put him on a baseball card, and he has every intention of making it to the majors one day. 
which is fine by his parents, as long as he continues to keep his room just as clean as he did his imaginary home plate. Steve Hartman, On the Road, near Raleigh, North Carolina. When a play-by-play -play announcer sits down in front of a microphone, they never know who might be listening. CBS's Steve Hartman goes on the road with the trailblazing broadcaster. 11-year-old Ellie Dowdy of Amherst, Virginia, eats, sleeps, and talks baseball. Now up to bat. She announces for her local junior varsity team and practices big league broadcasting from her living room. Look at his blocking skills. But she didn't know girls could do this as a career until she listened to a Baltimore Orioles game. But now there's two outs. And I thought, I can do that too. That is possible. Ellie's proof possible is play-by-play -play announcer Melanie Newman. How are we doing? Ellie was so taken by her that last year she reached out to Melanie in the only way she knew how. Oh, that is cute. Her sign read, hey, Melanie, hey, Melanie Newman. Newman, need help in the, the booth? booth? There's Mel. And the answer was yes. One, one. All right, Ellie, are you ready to call a pitch? Yeah, yes, ma'am. All right. This so week, Melanie invited Ellie to call part of a game. Have a 3-2 count. Because Melanie assumed that's what the girl wanted. We have a outside ball. And it was, in part. But when Ellie held up that sign, she didn't just want to help Melanie in the booth. She wanted to help Melanie as a person. I was just hoping that she would see it and see that a lot of young girls are looking up to her because when Melanie was growing up, she had to push through all the people telling her that no, only men can do that. It's true. And even today, some men are still hurling sexist barbs at Melanie on social media. But there to deflect them with her single ply poster board stands Ellie Dowdy, who returned with a new sign that read, Melanie Newman is fire. What does that feel like to see that? It really takes you back for a minute. And here's where we saw just how much Melanie appreciates the support. I paid a lot of dues to just get here. And the hope is when those little girls make those signs, their dues are so much less. In sports, people are always clawing their way to the top. This is so cool. But the true heroes of any game are the ones who lift others. Steve Hartman on the road in Baltimore. You've heard the phrase, don't judge a book by its cover. It might as well describe the man in our next story. He's a carpet cleaner by day, but it's his hobby that has people talking. Here's CBS's Steve Hartman on the road. 46-year-old Vaughn Smith of Gaithersburg, Maryland, was reluctant to even do this story. It's not something that's like, oh, yeah, I'm the best. That's all it's about. In fact, most people didn't even know you had this skill. Correct. You were just the guy cleaning the carpets. I was just the guy cleaning the carpets, yeah. Although a carpet cleaner by trade, Vaughn's real gift is for words. He is what linguists call a hyperpolyglot, defined as a person who can speak at least 11 languages. As someone who took four years of French in high school and only remembers un poquito, the idea that anyone could speak 11 languages is unfathomable. But Vaughn doesn't just know 11. As the Washington Post recently verified, he is fluent in or has a basic grasp of all these languages. Spanish, Italian, Portuguese. This may take a while. I speak some Hungarian, I speak Finnish pretty well, I speak some Estonian. He also knows Welsh, Norwegian, Japanese, Hebrew, and even American Sign Language. That I had. Vaughn studies mostly with apps and books, uploading new words and phrases with almost fiber optic speed. So far, he has learned about 40 languages. Do people immediately like you more when you speak their language? Most of the time, yes. Is that part of the draw for you? Yes. Although never diagnosed, Vaughn suspects, and his mother Sandra agrees, that he is probably autistic. Oh yes, that was the problem. He had lack of participation, lack of communication. Not able to express my feelings properly or misinterpreting other people's feelings or intentions. But over the years, Vaughn has learned that when you make the effort to speak to someone in their native tongue, people are so grateful 
friendships often follow. Uh, what's Nelly? It's about being able to connect with people. It's so good. And you don't need to know any languages <laughs> to understand the importance of that. Steve Hartman, On the Road, in Gaithersburg, Maryland. Now to an emergency in America where young people are helping to save the day. CBS's Steve Hartman goes On the Road. When people call for an ambulance in Sackets Harbor, New York, and the crew shows up at their front door, almost everyone has the same reaction. A lot of people just come up and ask you, like, wait, how old are you? You're the EMT? <laughs> or like, when's the ambulance coming? So what do you say? Do you just explain to them, we are the ambulance? <laughs> <laughs> These baby-faced first responders took over the village's emergency medical services not long after COVID hit, when all the older EMS volunteers either couldn't or wouldn't do the job anymore. That exodus, part of a national trend. In rural America, 35% of ambulance services are all volunteer. And many of those departments, 69% say they're struggling to find help. Fortunately, at least in Sackets Harbor, desperation led to inspiration. In New York State, you can be an EMT at 17 and can assist even younger. And when these local high schoolers heard that, they decided to step up, took the required training, and resuscitated the department. We went from not even having our licenses to saving people's lives. <laughs> Being able to help those people, I really like doing that. So. And by all accounts, they are doing that. Whether you've fallen off a ladder. They're very professional. Have severe chest pains. They know what they're doing. Or can barely breathe. Absolutely credit them for saving my life. This group of teens and young adults save the day almost every day, sacrificing much of their free time and surrendering some of their innocence. They say the hardest part is telling people their loved one is gone. Um, it's like time freezes and everything stops, and that's one of the hardest things to do, for sure. And then you go back to algebra class. Yeah. What's hard? <laughs> so why do it? because who else is there to do it if we don't? Someone needs to. Someone needs to step up and do it. American youth to the rescue once more. Steve Hartman on the road in Sackets Harbor, New York. Nowhere is America's labor shortage more apparent and the solution more unique than at the general store CBS's Steve Hartman found on the road. Here in Norwich, Vermont, for more than a century, this general store has been as much a fixture in the community as the church steeple. But then that sign went up, screaming a desperate need in neon orange, a warning sign of an end approaching. Dan Frazier is the owner of Dan and Wits. How many openings did you have? <laughs> All of them. <laughs> All of them. Yeah. It was like, we're going to have to lock the front door because we have zero help. This was your dad's business. This was your grandfather's business. Right. And it was going to close on your watch? Yeah, which would be tough when you've invested your whole life into it. Customers were equally devastated. Of course, that happens whenever a small town loses an iconic business. But what sets this place apart is that these customers didn't just give Dan their sympathies. They gave him their applications. I'm so excited to have you here. Oh, it's so nice to be here. So this retired so finance director applied for a job in the deli. There we go. Dr. Rick Farrell is working checkout. I'm just trying to get the cash register to work. People from all over town and all walks of life in. punched in to help Dan stay open. There I am. I'm a therapist. Teacher, second grade teacher. Professor of psychology. Principal of the middle school. I'm an RN. So far, nearly two dozen customers, like Diane Miller, have stepped up. Because Dan and Wits is the heartbeat of this community. It's the heart of our town. For some reason, the heart of the town. I really got this sense. It's the heart of this town. That Dan and his store are the heart of the town. Yeah. And as if stocking shelves and running register weren't enough, virtually all of these new hires are donating their hourly wage to some of Dan's favorite charities. Dan says this has all been just the help he needed. Absolutely. Um, the fact that the community stepped up, you know, I mean, sometimes it takes sort of a crisis, if you will, to 
appreciate what you have. Right, how are you? And in Norwich, they have what every town needs more than anything. Thank you. Each other. Steve Hartman, On the Road, in Norwich, Vermont. For some, service is a lifetime commitment. CBS's Steve Hartman with a case in point, On the Road. If anyone has earned a coffee break, it's 63-year-old Mike Mason of Midlothian, Virginia. Mike served his country, first as a captain in the Marines. Mike Mason from the FBI. And later as the number four man at the FBI. Good afternoon. Mike left the bureau in 2007, went on to work as an executive at a Fortune 500 company, and then the chief operating officer of this rocking chair. But Mike says retirement did not sit well with him. I still had a mind, and I still had things I thought I was capable of doing. But if Mike was going to start a new chapter, he knew it would have to be something really important, a job with a big payout worthy of his time. So in the end, the choice was clear. How are you doing? Hi. From top of the FBI doing great. to head of the BUS, Mike Mason may be the most overqualified school bus driver in America. When I gave them my resume, I actually got called by a very senior person in the county, and he said, mm, just checking. <laughs> Did why, you mean to apply for this job? Why, why do you want to be a bus driver? And I told him. Mike had heard the Chesterfield County Public School District was down 125 drivers, part of a national crisis. In fact, more than half the school districts in America are reporting severe driver shortages. So Mike stepped up and went all in. I mean, this guy actually waxes his bus. Why? Because <laughs> because I it's just how I roll. This is the Marines coming back. It is, but I think this is important work. I do. Do you sincerely believe that what you're doing today is as important as what you were doing at the FBI? I do. I think in, in our society, we need to get next to the idea that there are no unimportant jobs. I mean, what could be more important than the attention we pay to our education system? So you continue to advance in your career? That's exactly right. I'm paid a lot less, but I, I continue to advance in my career. Yes, indeed. As for the salary, Mike says he already donated all of what he expects to make this year, more than $30,000 to various charities. But of course, the much bigger gift is far less tangible. <laughs> Mike Mason had climbed to the highest level. According to the indictment, but by stepping back down to the bottom rung, he is giving us the greatest leadership of all. Leadership by example. All right, see you later. Steve Hartman on the road in Midlothian, Virginia. Nearly a month after Hurricane Ida slammed Louisiana, about 13,000 homes and businesses are still in the dark. Tonight, CBS's Steve Hartman is on the road with volunteers who are casting the light of kindness. After Hurricane Ida, linemen from across the country came here to southern Louisiana to restore power and found an angel in the flood. Hot lunch! A woman actually named Angel Flood. We got gumbo, y'all! I just knew it from the beginning. I was like, we've got to feed these people. So, under her own blue tarped roof, Angel began prepping lunch for the linemen working in and around Homa, Louisiana. Couldn't stand the thought of them eating cold, processed food. There was no restaurants. Yeah, nothing in Homa was open. No power, no water. So if you wanted food, it came to you? It came to the women of Louisiana, yeah. And that's the thing. Somebody's here. It's not just Angel. Come in. Not by a long shot. Good morning, we're turning and burning. Turning and burning. While we were there, seemed every 15 minutes, someone else showed up with a side dish. A scene that repeats daily here in Homa and across Louisiana. It's good? It's good. Okay. On this Facebook group, we found thousands of women and men helping the linemen in every parish affected by the storm. They've been preparing meals, offering rooms, even doing laundry. It's like checking your chickens and you got an egg. <laughs> Angel tells the men to leave their dirty clothes on the porch and has them fluffed and folded by morning. Thank you. Very You're welcome. Much. For linemen like Jared Colley of Winter Garden, Florida, Gumbo. this treatment is unbelievable. Potato salad. They have been an absolute godsend to us. Y'all want drinks? I've been on a lot of storms. I've been doing this for quite some time. We've never been treated this good before. Not like this. That's, <laughs> like that's, this. that's, that's pretty cool. 
but Angel says it's the least she can do. Keep working hard. These guys put in 16 hour days, seven days a week, away from their families. We love y'all. And in talking to them, Angel has learned it's rarely about the money. It's about duty. If you're a lineman and you don't take a call to go on storm, is what they call it, it's like being in the Army and turning down deployment. So in Louisiana, they're now recognizing linemen for the heroes that they are. They're helping us to rebuild the community that we love so much. And that's how you restore the power Bye, baby. of gratitude. Steve Hartman, On the Road, in Homa, Louisiana. People in Louisiana have big hearts. We'll be right back. Now the story about the unbreakable bond between a mother and son. Here's CBS's Steve Hartman on the road. By his own admission, Dustin Vitale was a mama's boy. Mom, you ready? He cooked Gloria breakfast every morning. That's my baby. And thanked her for the privilege. Thank you, Mom. <laughs> as we first reported back in March. You're gonna make me cry. <laughs> because Dustin had such devotion, after his mom was diagnosed with terminal bladder cancer, he decided to try to take her on the trip she always dreamed of, to see the pyramids in Egypt. With the whole family, 14 people. Never mind that Dustin works as a middle school teacher in Philadelphia and could never afford the $10,000 to fly everyone. He thought he could raise the cheddar by selling cheesesteaks. There was no way you were gonna make enough money selling cheesesteaks out of your house. Yeah, correct, yeah, correct. So given that, what was pushing you forward? Just my, just my mom, you know, just the love for my mom. And so, with his love and her recipe, Dustin started making sandwiches. Sandwiches so big, no container could contain. He peddled them to friends and family. Thank you. Thank you, man. Appreciate your support. But those people must have told their friends and family, too. Because almost immediately, cars started double parking outside his house. Yep. Get your mom to Egypt. I'm trying, man. <laughs> Next, word spread on social media. Oh, my God. That's good. And before he knew it, oh, oh God. folks were lined up down the block. A food truck operator offered his services. <laughs> and in just six weeks, Dustin raised all the money he needed and then some, $18,000. The pharaoh was coming. The trip was in May. Oh my. The Egyptian government had seen our story and gave Gloria the Cleopatra treatment. She repeated over and over that it was the best thing that she's ever done in her life. Thank you. And she died not long after you got back. Yeah, came home and did hospice and passed. Did the whole trip help you at all with the grieving? Yes, we created so many new memories that will last forever. And to make sure no one ever forgets her, Dustin wants to open a cheesesteak restaurant. He doesn't know where or when, he just knows the name. Gloria's. Steve Hartman, CBS News, on the road. Tonight, from Virginia to Canada, businesses are signing up to take part in a war of words. Here's CBS's Steve Hartman, on the road. Everyone was getting along just fine in Christiansburg, Virginia. Peaceful, loving people there? For the most part, yeah. And why did you want to start trouble? <laughs> it was nothing better to do. Jim Bohan manages the Bridge Caldro Music Store. He fired the first salvo in what is rapidly devolving into World War. Put up this sign aimed at his shoe store neighbor. Hey, Super Shoes, want to start a sign war? The shoe store fired back. Our shoe strings are stronger than your guitar string. So it was game on. Yeah, after that I put back, yeah, but your shoe strings never got anyone a date. Ouch. That did escalate quickly, and it proliferated. With the exception of those pacifist hippies down at Power Equipment Supply, who protested make love, not sign war, just about every other business in and around Christiansburg signed up to join the fight throwing shade bombs at their fellow business owners. Everybody and their grandma has gotten in on it. <laughs> we just wanted to jump in. I just wanted to be punny like everybody else. Are there any rules of engagement? Nope. I think everybody's fair game. <laughs> Even businesses without signs are improvising. Even those normally above the fray are posting passages. 
Over the past few weeks, this war has gone viral on social media, and now skirmishes are flaring up in such far-flung places as Listowel, Ontario, where Speedy Glass instigated. I simply said, hey, DQ, want to have a sign war? They replied back within about 20 minutes, saying, you bet your glass we do. Trevor Cork says since then, conflict has spread across the province. You pretty much drive through any town in Ontario right now, and they have a sign war going. And this all stems back to that guitar store? Absolutely. Yeah, it's, it's all on him. I've often thought, like, where is this going to go and how is it going to end? Is, is it going to end? Hopefully not, because no war has ever brought more people together. So who will be next to join the fun? No telling. Steve Hartman, CBS News, on the road. <laughs> I think that means game on. You know, a smile doesn't cost a dime, but sometimes it brings a big reward. Here's Steve Hartman with tonight's On the Road. A pizza delivery man got a much bigger piece of the pie this month when a customer here in Tipton, Indiana, tipped him way more than 15%. You know, I couldn't believe it. It's almost like it's surreal. Robert Peters has been delivering pizzas 31 years. Pizza Hut says he's one of their longest tenured delivery people, which Robert admits isn't something most folks aspire to. There are people in my family that were, you know, say maybe you should consider something a little bit more financially stable, but um, it is my purpose in life trying to make people happy. You know, when you're delivering to somebody, you may be the only face they even see all day. It's good to see you again. Thank you. And it's that attitude. Hey, how you doing? Combined with an almost obsessive devotion to customer service. I always appreciate you, man. That has earned Robert a real reputation in this town. So thank you so much. Tanner Langley is a regular. Take care. He says, God forbid you pay for a pizza and Robert can't make exact change. He'll drive three or four miles down the road in a blizzard just to bring you, you know, 15 cents and change. But you're tipping him anyway. Yeah. Why does 15 cents matter? It's the moral of it. He didn't want to feel like you had to tip him because he didn't have the change. After so many experiences like that, Tanner felt compelled to give Robert a tip commensurate with his job performance. So he reached out to the community and asked them to pitch in to buy Robert a new car. Robert's 93 olds was an ancient. But in just three days, the good people of Tipton donated enough for this. Oh, wow. A shiny red Chevy Malibu, plus insurance and gas money, $19,000 total. Tanner, how do you explain this? That's what I'm saying. That is the type of impact that he has on people. And that really makes me, makes me feel really, really good inside. Here are your keys. This week, we got a new president. But Robert proves the most important job in America, in fact, the only job that you know can make the world a better place, is yours. Thank you. You too. Thank you. See you later. Steve Hartman, CBS News, on the road. That is the tip of a lifetime. We can tell you this is apparently the first car that Robert has ever had that was made in the 21st century. Remember, that's American kindness. As painful as 2020 was, CBS's Steve Hartman shared stories that gave us hope. Tonight, Steve's back on the road to revisit a favorite. Any electrician can flip a switch, but only John Kinney of Woburn, Massachusetts can make a customer light up like this. Please don't pinch me because I don't want to wake up. Yeah. <laughs> That's one fine electrician. Oh. <laughs> A thousand times over. As we first reported a few months ago, it all started when 73-year-old Gloria Scott called John to fix a ceiling light. But he soon discovered that broken light was the least of her problems. Too poor to make any house repairs and too prideful to ask for help, Gloria's house was in total disrepair. No lights, no running water. Yeah, I think I seen on a Friday and it stuck with me over the weekend. I said, I gotta go back there, you know. So John returned and started working for free. He also started a Facebook page titled, Nice Old Lady Needs Help, where he called on other tradespeople to join him. On the Facebook page, you said, it's not like we're trying to rebuild her whole house. <laughs> yeah, well now it looks like we are. <laughs> it sure does. This whole porch is gonna get rebuilt. You can see up there, that's where like a lot of the raccoons and stuff were getting in. They spent months putting in all new electrical, all new plumbing, 
new windows and walls and ceilings. Almost everything got repaired or replaced, from the backyard lawn to the front porch steps. Wow. It's what you're supposed to do. It's what you're supposed to do. Seems the whole town of Woburn has bought into that mantra. Come on. <laughs> and as a result, today, the old eyesore is a sight for sore eyes. All her blight replaced with pure delight. I can't even comprehend the gratitude that I have. John is equally speechless. Yep. It's just, there's no words for it, you know. It's not going to end with this house, though, either, is it? I don't want it to, and that's why we put a name to it, the Glorious Gladiators, and we want to keep going with this. John is now setting up chapters of Glorious Gladiators across the country, helping seniors in similar situations. Seniors like Gloria Scott, who had a broken light, but now shines brightly thanks to an electrician, hardwired for kindness. Steve Hartman, On the Road, in Woburn, Massachusetts. At the end of a heartbreaking week, Steve Hartman has a story that gives us what we need most, hope. Here's tonight's On the Road. For ICU nurse Caitlin Obrock, the last year has been a blur. She has treated hundreds of COVID patients here at Barnes Jewish Hospital in St. Louis. But she says one patient stands above. Um, from the very beginning, Monique was special to me. 28-year-old Monique Jones came to the hospital deathly ill from COVID and six months pregnant. The baby was priority over her. She would do anything for her baby. Eventually, Monique had to be intubated. But Caitlin still talked to her, prayed over her countless hours. And when doctors decided the only hope for mother and child was an emergency C-section, Caitlin made a promise. And I was like, if Monique makes it, we're going to throw her the biggest baby shower there is to have. A promise she joyfully kept when Zamira arrived. All two pounds, five ounces of her. I just started crying as soon as I saw everything. I'm like, this couldn't be for me. <laughs> Caitlin raised thousands of dollars from friends, family, and coworkers. And even though her favorite patients are now out of the hospital, oh my God. Caitlin still visits regularly. It's so big. Has to. <laughs> She's the godmother and Monique's new best friend. I never really felt that special to somebody. I really needed somebody like her. It's important, especially at the end of this god-awful week, to know that while all this was happening, so was this. While chaos reigned in Washington, compassion ruled in this corner of the heartland and across the country, because the soul of America can't be ransacked. And the solution to what ails us, sure as heck, isn't under a dome. It's not a matter of politics. It's just a matter of loving people. That's what we need. Um, the days that I feel like I can't go anymore, through those hard days when I don't think my patient's going to make it, um, that I just know there's another Monique that needs us. And there's your battle cry, America, for a real uprising. <laughs> Steve Hartman, CBS News, on the road. You just never know where Secret Santa will show up or who he might be helping. This Christmas, Santa's delivering holiday cheer to essential workers with an assist from CBS's Steve Hartman. Here is tonight's On the Road. For a brief moment, I felt bad for Kimberly Davis. Not because she has to clean a COVID ward. She loves her job at Houston Methodist. I felt bad for Kimberly because I lied to Kimberly. They told you I was doing a story about essential workers, right? Correct. Uh, we're not doing a story about essential workers. Truth be told, oh. I had to lie to everyone I spoke to for this story. And when they discovered my real intent. I'm sorry, I'm at, I'm at a loss. Um, most were speechless. Oh, wow. Lips a quiver, many oh. in tears. <laughs> my partner in this joyful deception was an anonymous wealthy businessman known to me only as Secret Santa. <laughs> In a normal year, Merry Christmas. Secret Merry Santa Christmas. personally hands out hundreds of hundred dollar bills to random strangers. Crazy! But this year, the novel coronavirus called for a novel sleigh ride. So he mailed packages to carefully selected essential workers across the nation. And inside that is a sealed envelope. 
that says do not open until instructed to do so by Steve Hartman at CBS. His targets included Ashton Dooley, a sanitation worker from Sarasota, Florida, whose brand new bride has cancer. She let me shave her head that first time. That's when I knew I wanted to marry her. Elgin Thrower, a security guard from Kansas City with a special needs son and a dream to be a police officer. In law enforcement, I can make a difference. And Danielle Dipp, a waitress from Pittsburgh, who's way behind on rent. It has been a pretty bad year, but somehow, somewhere, something's gonna work out. On that note, I'd like to introduce somebody to you. Okay. Hi, this is Secret Santa. Danielle's bad uh, year was about to get a whole lot better. Open up that sealed envelope. Okay. Everyone's bad year was about to get a whole lot better. Oh my gosh, there's money in there, you guys. <laughs> this holiday season, Secret Santa gave away about $100,000 total to total strangers. Oh my God. And that's to help make your Christmas just a little bit better. Oh my God, I can't believe this. But of course, the money isn't the real gift here. Thank you. You know, kindness, when freely given, with no expectation in return, is in fact unconditional love. And that's really what we're giving them. And what does it feel like to receive such a gift? Um, well, sometimes being speechless. I'm sorry. Says it all. Are you okay? Steve Hartman, CBS News. I'm sorry. On the road. Some relationships simply defy explanation. Here's CBS's Steve Hartman on the road at sea. It can be a lonely job, pulling lobster traps way out here in the middle of the Gulf of Maine. But for 15 years, Captain John Mikowski had company, a faithful companion. In fact, he says, maybe a little too faithful. She comes right up to the window and is looking at me this far away. I mean, <laughs> just, you know, just staring at me. You know? <laughs> John's stalker girlfriend, who he named Red Eye, showed up one day in 2005 and basically never left. Until a few months ago, when Red Eye suffered a leg injury. John knew a seagull couldn't live long like that. How hard was it for him? Oh, very, very difficult. John's wife, yeah, Debbie. Like to watch John and how to see how sad he was. I could, I could tear up right now. I don't know why I was so emotionally crushed, but there was a piece missing. I was beginning to wonder how much longer I felt like doing this. So, in an attempt to save his passion for the sea, he tried to save that seagull, actually caught her and brought her to the Center for Wildlife in Cape Nettick, Maine. The staff nursed Red Eye while John spoiled her with brown hake her favorite kind of fish. And would you believe, just a few weeks later, Red Eye was good as new. Earlier this month, John released the bird back into the wild. Perfect. Of course, the wild was never really Red Eye's thing, which is why, still today, no matter where John is in this great ocean, That's her. Red Eye somehow finds him. That a girl. For centuries, Boat captains have believed seagulls carry the souls of lost sailors. And for this fourth generation lobsterman, that is a comforting thought, that maybe Red Eye is an ancestor looking out for him. But John says it's more about something far less mystical. It's about the purpose that is found whenever two living creatures truly need each other. Steve Hartman on the road in the Gulf of Maine. It all started with a simple request from a customer. Now a newspaper carrier has found a whole new mission. Here's CBS's Steve Hartman on the road. Long before social distancing, Greg Daly was already keeping his customers at arm's length. In fact, to those on his paper route in central New Jersey, Greg has never been anything more than a blur past their driveway. But as we first reported in April, all that changed when one elderly customer asked him a simple favor. Could he please pull in and throw the paper closer to the garage? It hit me that if she can't get the paper at the sidewalk, which is 20 feet from the house, in this pandemic, how is she going to get the things she needs? So a couple of days later, I just decided, you know what, I'm going to put this note out. The note 
stuck in the next day's edition, said, My name is Greg Daly, and I deliver your newspaper every morning, which was news to most people. I would like to offer my services, free of charge, to anyone who needs groceries. It'll be an, it'll From that moment to this, tomorrow, okay? the phone has like been now. ringing off the hook. He takes the orders, does the shopping, and delivers the groceries, not by whipping them out the window, but by carefully placing them on the porch. How are you? And boy, are people grateful. Step back and I'll put them in the house for you. Eileen Stein okay. is 85 and recently widowed. I don't have enough adjectives. He is one of the finest people in the world. The lady at this house went even further called him the closest thing to God. God. <laughs> There's a level of appreciation here, Steve, that goes above and beyond anything I've ever seen. So no, I'm not gonna stop. Well, you'll stop when this is done. I, <laughs> Greg said, not necessarily. There's something about being able to do something really nice for people. And sure enough, since this story first aired, Greg has expanded his mission. About 130 seniors are now on his grocery route. It's my pleasure. He's also added about a dozen volunteers, mostly college students, who assist with the shopping. And he has plans to do still more. Okay. Greg Daly was called to duty by circumstance but he's staying in service by choice. Have a great day, all right? Steve Hartman, CBS News, on the road. There is simply no way to fully repay the medical workers on the front line of the pandemic, but CBS's Steve Hartman found someone who's saying thank you in his own way. Here's tonight's On the Road. When Steve Derrick of Clifton Park, New York, paints a portrait, there's no such thing as a touch-up. He includes every bruise, bag and blood vessel. You're not capturing them at their best moment. I, I, I think I am. Oh, interesting. That's when they're strongest, not when everything's rainbows and butterflies behind them. Indeed, the only thing his subjects have behind them is a 12-hour hospital shift. In the paintings, you see the marks from the masks, the fight in their eyes, and the admiration the artist has for all of them. When this pandemic began, Steve says he wanted to do something as a thank you to those on the front lines. So the amateur artist spent hours in his basement painting tributes to these warriors. So far, he's done about 100 portraits, many nurses here at Albany Medical Center in Albany, New York. And although Steve refuses payment of any kind, he says he's gotten very rich in another way. Right here, it's just, that's the payment. That's the reason I do it. I Wealth beyond words. Yeah. Steve says he has been overwhelmed by the impact his paintings have had on his subjects, like Albany Med ER nurse Michelle Hanna. You know, it doesn't make me look glamorous by any stretch of the imagination, but it makes me look like who and what I am and what I was doing. Michelle recently stopped by to meet Steve and check out an exhibit of his work at the Albany Center Gallery. These are amazing. She was deeply moved by the art. But it's the most beautiful thing anybody's ever done for me. So. But even more so Sorry. by the artist and his large-scale generosity. Steve will now be giving away every portrait to the person in it. A forever mirror reflecting that time in their lives when they were at their most beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> Steve Hartman on the road in Albany, New York. Every day we are in awe of our health care heroes risking their lives, including the woman you're about to meet. Here's Steve Hartman with tonight's On the Road. We begin today with an alarming new milestone. As the misery spreads. Spreading. Spreading quickly. Most of us are relieved to be watching the worst of it from the safety of our sofas. deadly record. 47-year-old Bevan Strickland of High Point, North Carolina, was one of those comfortably on the couch. But some switch flipped in you. Yeah, it was kind of a switch. That's funny that you say that because I was like, wait a minute, why am I sitting here? Bevan, a nurse, had just contracted a serious case of empathy. I can imagine the nurses being so exhausted, so stressed out. If I can just go and relieve a shift for them. It's totally crazy right now. That was a month ago. And today, Bevan is working at Mount Sinai, Queens, the epicenter of the outbreak in New York City. She cares for the sickest patients under the most demanding conditions, solely because she believes she was made for a moment like this. Uh, I'm not afraid. I'm not easily uh, shaken by things. I was in a bank robbery. I was 
held at gunpoint. I was tied up for 15 minutes. Um, he was tying me up and I said, I said, are we on candid camera? And you know, I wanted to make him laugh. I figured I'll make myself human to him and then he won't want to kill me. It was at that point that I realized this was no ordinary hero. <laughs> then I learned that although she's not technically a volunteer, she has to get paid for legal reasons. Bevan plans to donate everything she makes after expenses to the Mount Sinai support staff. And the fact is, she could really use the money. She has student loans, and she's a single mom with twin 16-year-old boys back home. Cheers, man. Did she ask you if she could do this, or did she tell you she was doing it? She says multiple times, even mm -hmm. after saying yes, she's yeah. like, are you sure you want me to? And Why did you say yes? This life is, life is not to just serve yourself, but to serve others. These apples didn't fall far. I believe it's our duty. I believe we should be compelled to do something when we can. There's a switch that goes off in some people during perilous times. Whether it's the football coach who steps in to stop a school shooter, the NFL player who joins the Army after 9-11, or the nurse who simply stands up from her couch. There will always be those who run toward disaster when everyone else is fleeing. Somebody's got to help. What if we all said we couldn't handle it and we couldn't do it? You know, what if everybody said that? It certainly wouldn't be America. Steve Hartman, CBS News, on the road. And we are so grateful to her and so many others who have answered the call. Steve Hartman's been busy this week, like many of you, teaching and working from home. And there's homework. Here's tonight's On the Road. But here the sign says Kindness 101 will begin shortly. It wasn't exactly the most polished production. Hey everybody. This week, with the help of my God-given teaching assistants, this isn't a TV studio, right? I held an online class in kindness. Try that word. What is that word? Altruism, I guess. Al I don't know. Okay, looks like altruism. But despite the low budget, we had high turnout. Tens of thousands of kids from across the country tuned in. One of the things we talked about in class was heroism, and how heroes today are wearing all different kinds of uniforms. Their assignment for the week was to pick one of these new heroes and thank them in any way they could. Thank you for working. Some kids went straight to the phone to thank the pharmacists an day. and the fire chiefs nice and the workers in nursing homes. Especially with coronavirus going around. Others used sidewalk chalk to thank their mail carriers, FedEx and UPS drivers. While still other children, of all ages I might add, broke out markers and crayons to write thank you notes to the people they now look up to most. I was thinking, who should I give it to? Because there's so many heroes here today. Yeah. And I decided on the truck driver. Nine-year-old Tyler Carr taped his note to a loading dock at a Kroger in Arlington, Texas. It read in part, I appreciate that you're still going out and driving your truck because all of us are sitting on our butts watching TV and eating Cheetos. Bailey Kilman of Cooper City, Florida chose to thank her sanitation worker. Using good social distancing, she handed her note to Remy Felizor. Whew, man, she made my day. I was emotional. Thank you very much. Remy says he's not used to people thanking him for his service. I can't even forget about that moment. Really? Yes, sir. It was all A-plus work. Thank you so much. Which is why my thank you goes to all the students who sat through and graduated. Kindness 101. Because you know there are better things on TV. <laughs> <laughs> You're being kind by not saying anything. You learned your lesson. <laughs> yes, I guess I did. <laughs> Steve Hartman, at home, in Catskill, New York. That's great. We're all trying to learn something during this coronavirus case crisis. Just saying thank you means so much. The story of David Ayers, the unexpected hockey hero, left Steve Hartman inspired. Inspired to try something crazy. So here's tonight's On the Road. When a former Zamboni driver took to the ice last week as an emergency replacement goaltender and stopped eight out of ten shots, he became an overnight sensation. Interviews and autographs, everyone celebrating the average Joe who appeared to be as good as an NHL goalie. But I wondered if maybe the opposite was true, that maybe NHL goalies are no better than the average Joe. To test my theory, I suited up the most average Joe I know, 
me. Prior to this, the only hockey position I ever played Ready? was hockey dad. You got it? My son Emmett signed up for lessons a few months ago, and from my place in the stands, I almost immediately started questioning the goalie position. Is it really as hard as everyone makes it look? Or might a bale of hay perform just as well? So this week, I brought my skepticism to Springfield, Massachusetts, home of the minor league Springfield Thunderbirds. Chris Drieger is their goalie, and like everyone else in America, Chris was amazed that a Zamboni driver could do so well. Can you believe it? I can, <laughs> because I think goaling is a lot easier than people than it looks, think. Yeah. yeah. Like, you can go out there and make some saves. Like, they're going to hit you sometimes. Yeah, right, because Which, you, you take up in, most of the net. Yeah, yeah, you take up the net. A goal opening is 24 square feet, but a person in pads takes up almost half that, leaving just a few pockets to even defend. I predict I'm going to block 8 out of 10, just like the Zamboni driver. I drive a car. How different is that than a Zamboni? And with that, it was time to put my lack of skills to the test. My opponent would be no slouch, a prime NHL prospect named Henrik Borgstrom. You think you can score on me every time? I highly think so, yeah. You can't even hold your stick right. Game on, rink rat. So, is goaltending really that hard? Initial indications seem to be... Yes. He's kind of slowish. In fact, as our experiment progressed oh! and the taste of crow filled my Ooh, senses, that was close. I started to believe that not only is this job hard, I touched it. it may be one of the most impossible in sports. That's cheating. In the end, he made nine out of 10. You missed. And I made a promise that next time anything looks easy, <laughs> I'm keeping my big goal shut. <laughs> Steve Hartman on the road in Springfield, Massachusetts. Of all the stories that Steve Hartman has covered on the road this year, the one that's been shared the most by our viewers is the story of school bus driver Curtis Jenkins. Tonight, Steve has a big surprise. You can see why someone might hate being a school bus driver. The early hours, when the weather sours, the abundance of responsibility combined with the absence of eyes in the back of your head. Y'all have a good day. Nevertheless, as we first reported last May, Curtis Jenkins loves delivering these little ones to Lake Highlands Elementary in Dallas, Texas. Yes. Emily Grunninger is the principal. He goes way beyond the outline responsibilities and duties of a bus driver. I mean, that bus is like a family. These are my children. These are my community. I love them all. To establish community, What's your job, man? he starts by giving everyone responsibility. This is one of the police officers. It's an elaborate flow chart. She's the administrative assistant to she's the president. She's administrative assistant to yeah, the president. She's, yeah. Everyone working together to build a yellow bus utopia. Yeah. And we're going to care about each other and we're going to love everybody, right? Yeah. I put time, effort, love, care, understanding, understanding each and every one of those kids. Omar. To show his love and understanding, hey, Chief. Curtis gives presents throughout the year. You say you like baseball. Each gift personally selected with that child in mind. Hey. He gave this girl a T-shirt. Her first book with a picture from a book she made. I'm hoping this T-shirt inspire her to keep on writing books. Over the years, he has bought these kids bikes, backpacks, handed out cards on birthdays, and even turkeys at Thanksgiving. He has spent thousands out of his own pocket. And yet, if you ask the kids what they like most about Curtis, the gifts don't even come up. He helps anyone in need. Ethan Engel is a sixth grader. It means a lot to you. Yeah. He says the bus ride is often the best part of his day. My mom got divorced when I was only four. I'll see you tomorrow. He's the father that I always wanted. In some ways, I just, I wish my dad could have been like that. We make the mistake sometimes of thinking certain jobs are more important than others. I know. But Curtis Jenkins made his job important. Right, and in doing so, even created his own salary. Bye -bye. That's the paycheck right there. If I can get that, you can keep the money. <laughs> he sought no reward. But after our story first aired, the kindness came back to him nonetheless, when an anonymous viewer reached out to school superintendent Jeannie Stone with a little thank you gift for Curtis. You're gonna be driving this brand new car! In addition to the car, she also gave him a promotion. 
Curtis now teaches others how to have better student relationships. For this old bus driver, 2019 sure proved to be quite a ride. Steve Hartman, On the Road, in Dallas. Finally tonight, sometimes the best lessons in life are those we learn on the way to school. Here's CBS's Steve Hartman, On the Road. <laughs> this may look like a normal family reunion, but as you'll soon see, Reed Moon of Zelianople, Pennsylvania, is no ordinary patriarch. Good to see you. And this is no ordinary family. This is Anagale. Far from it. Bethany. Here's DJ. The handsome lad. That's Lewis. How many kids do you have? I'll say 200. Maybe even more. No, they're not biologically my kids. But emotionally, they surely are. That's how attached he is to the students who rode his school bus, a job he held for 27 years, even though it wasn't exactly his first choice. Reed sort of fell into the job. Well, not sort of, he, he did fall into the job. In 1990, he fell off a roof working as a handyman. After that, he wanted a job closer to the ground. But ironically, he says no job has ever lifted him higher. It's his children. And being in a position where you can love kids every single day is a lovely position to be in. Like he just made everybody feel safe and loved and cared for. Do anything he possibly could to help somebody. I don't really have a teacher that I remember. I remember my bus driver. So many kids feel the exact same way, that more than 20 of them had Reed, who was also a pastor, officiate their weddings. A bond so strong that even though Reed retired years ago, former students gathered recently for one last ride. And they're finding their assigned seat. Right here in the front. <laughs> that they had 20 years ago. And now their child is sitting on their lap. And that kind of feeling is a wonderful thing. <laughs> and as for his secret to fostering all this. So he only had two rules on the bus. Show everyone love and respect. Love and respect to everybody. It's a lesson they carry with them. Love and respect. And on them. Got a love and respect tattoo? I'm convinced that when you love and respect people, most of the time, that's what you're going to get back. Get back. Have a good day, Mr. Smith. By the bus load. Thanks, Rosie. Have a great day at school, honey. Steve Hartman, on the road, in Zelianople, Pennsylvania. Learn lots. We conclude this week with Steve Hartman, who has one request. Don't jump to conclusions. Here we are, just two seconds into this story, and some of you may have already made some assumptions about our subject, Maury Forrester. But the students here at Coulter Grove Intermediate School near Knoxville, Tennessee, All right. say, be wary of that first impression. Hey guys. You never know what people have done. I was surprised. It makes you wonder, like, how did he get here? Liftoff, we have a liftoff. 77-year-old Maury Forrester was part of the team that helped put a man on the moon. Zero, zero. During the Saturn and Apollo programs, he worked for a zero, subcontractor zero. that designed crucial launch components. Zero. Go. I look at it now, I'm amazed that it happened. It was so complex and so involved, and there were so many people. His certificates and awards could fill a corner office, and yet here he is in a broom closet a highly trained electromechanical designer on the business end of a mop. In 2014, Maury suffered a stroke, or something like it, doctors aren't quite sure, but the result was clear, a major loss of cognitive function. Maury says it was humbling and humiliating, but he knew if he wanted to keep on living, he had to keep on working. He originally took this job solely for the exercise. But over the last few months, he has become an integral part of this school community. I just love it. They're happy to see me. Thank you guys and I'm so happy much. to see them. Thank you. I've gotten to care very much for them. Thank you, guys. And the students clearly feel the same. In fact, Maury says they even say, I love you. Yeah. Just hearing that makes, it makes all the difference to me. And nobody ever said that at NASA? <laughs> no, not that I can remember. <laughs> Which leads me to the most astonishing part of this story. Oh, gosh. After that, I ask more. Hey, guys. What if by some miracle he got his mind back and could go back to his old job? There was no hesitation. Yeah, I can't, I can't say that I'm going to give this up. 
I'm good, how are you? Some people never figure out the key to a successful career. But Maury shows it's not rocket science. Steve Hartman, on the road, near Knoxville, Tennessee. Finally tonight, who doesn't love surprises? Here's Steve Hartman on the road. Good. What you want? No matter what you order from school cafeteria worker Deborah Davis. I have a Caesar salad. I have chicken patty, chicken and rice. Every meal comes with a sweetie pie. All right, sweetie pie, you welcome. Auntie Deborah, as she's known here at Hoover High School, doles out a heaping helping of hospitality every lunch hour. You welcome, sweetie. And this is just her first course of kindness. See y'all tomorrow. After serving food all day, I come out here. After lunch, Deborah drives her beat up 76 Chevy Malibu all over San Diego, looking for hungry homeless people. Hey, babe, how are you? Looks like she's okay. No, she's not. Deborah says somewhere. she's never met a homeless person who wasn't starving for her home cooking. Come on, tell them over there to come on and eat. On this day, she served more than 50 multi course meals. You got four curry chicken and rice, collard greens, and smoked turkey. All at barbecue her own chicken, expense. Uh, barbecue ribs. Yeah. Are you broke? No. I took that as a yes. You're spending money you don't have. Yes, but. I, but you don't understand the joy that I get from feeding people. Tomorrow's spaghetti and meatballs, okay? Because Deborah is so selfless. Thank you for joining us. Recently, the school district invited her down to the auto shop, surprised her with friends and family, and some better wheels to deliver those meals. This 2014 Mazda 3 was refurbished by an auto body class in the district. But to Deborah, it was like mint. I'm not used to a new car, y'all. She was so flabbergasted. What do I do? She didn't even know where to start. Literally. Oh, okay. <laughs> what does it mean to you that faculty, the staff, the kids all wanted you to have this gift? <laughs> that I'm making a difference in their life, you know? I was looking for my reward in heaven, and y'all gave me a little bit here on earth. Hallelujah. Heaven on earth for a woman who has always had room in her heart. Yeah. Just now. Look at that. More trunk space. Three aluminum pants this size. Steve Hartman on the road in San Diego. And I got tinted windows. We end the week here in the Pacific Northwest with a story about a man who is willing to do anything for others. Now his neighbors have done something for him. Here's Steve Hartman on the road. The most prominent citizen of Gresham, Oregon, is also the most unlikely businessman. And what is your business? It's delivery guy. 45-year-old <laughs> Todd Kiernan is autistic, although a more fitting label would be workaholic. 12 hours a day, seven days a week, sure. for almost 20 years. Yeah, I'm going there. Todd has been making deliveries and doing other odd jobs for virtually every business in downtown Gresham. Two for the dress lady. Whether it's a coffee run okay. or a run to the post office. I'm coming. He does whatever he's asked or not asked. He emptied this wastebasket at the hair salon simply because it was full. I like helping people, you know, making people happy, making people smile. In return, people tip him, of course. Right, that's for you. But this is so not about the money. <laughs> the smiles grow far too broad. How are you doing, friend? And the hugs last far too long for this to be a purely business arrangement. Love you. I love you. No, Todd is treasured. Mm. So much so, people in Gresham have often joked that he should have his own statue. He is one of the kindest, nicest people you'll meet. He's always smiling. He's just a big part of this community. He is the town, basically. Can't imagine downtown Gresham without Todd. Unfortunately, barring a parade in his honor, there's only so much a community can do to show its appreciation, which is why they threw a parade in his honor. <laughs> Last week, hundreds of people lined the streets of Gresham to pay tribute to their delivery guy. Todd loves old TV shows, so they borrowed a Batmobile to drive him into the center of town right. where they had another surprise waiting. Five, Remember those jokes about the statue? Well, those jokes are now solid bronze real.
This is a $54,000 likeness, paid for solely with cash and in-kind donations. How cool is that? Thank you for everyone being here for me in Garson, and I love you guys. In most cities, statues are reserved for founders and war heroes. But here in Gresham, they believe a simple passion, done with unconditional love, belongs on a pedestal, too. That is great work. Steve Hartman, on the road in Gresham, Oregon. I think we needed that story tonight. We end the week with Steve Hartman and an auto mechanic whose life took an unexpected turn on the road. I really want to be a doctor when yeah. I grow up. Whenever his two little girls play doctor and dream of becoming one someday. Let me take your heartbeat, doctor. 48-year-old master mechanic Carl Allenby is flooded with the feeling of deja vu. You wanted to be a doctor? Oh, yeah. But that wasn't realistic. Not where I came from, no. I grew up in East Cleveland, which is a very impoverished city. We were on welfare, and I remember the powdered milk, government powdered milk and uh, block cheese. And because they were so poor, young Carl quickly set aside his professional aspirations and focused instead on becoming the best auto mechanic he could be. So this was the parts store where I got all my customers from. So you would work on cars in the parking lot of the parts store? Oh yeah, sometimes till one, two o'clock in the morning. Eventually he got his own shop and for 15 years he did okay until one day he decided to ratchet things up. In 2006, Carl enrolled here at Ursuline College. His intention was to get a business degree to help him manage his repair shop. But there was one hurdle, a biology class. He couldn't understand why he had to take it, and he put it off as long as possible. I'm a business major. Yeah. What, what do I even care about biology? But I went to class, and in the first hour of being there, I knew what I wanted to do with the rest of my life. All those ideas of wanting to be a doctor just came rushing back. And to make a long story short, the car doctor, Dr. Carl Allenby, is now a doctor, doctor. Daddy, we love you! Last spring, Carl graduated from Northeast Ohio Medical University, and today he's an emergency medicine resident at Cleveland Clinic Akron General. Hey, Miss Fior. By all accounts, Hi. Carl is already an <laughs> exemplary doctor, partly because, according to his supervisors, he worked so long in a garage. That cannot translate. You'd be shocked, actually. I think it's some of the customer service. This is Dr. Rebecca Merrill. But could you imagine right now going and learning auto mechanics? No. <laughs> but Carl said he'll do our oil changes, so. Fortunately, Carl now has more important repairs on his mind. But this old auto mechanic also knows that whether you're working under a hood or staring down a hatch. Can I have you open up your mouth really wise? Your success hinges on your drive. I would hear people say, well, Carl, it's going to take nine years to become a doctor. Yeah. And I'd say, well, nine years are going to pass anyway. So I'd rather be someplace I want to be than someplace that I could have been. And there's the prescription right. yeah. Yeah. for the I can't do it blues. Steve Hartman on the road in Akron, Ohio. We end tonight with a man who insists he's nothing special. Well, lots of people disagree. Steve Hartman met him on the road. There is a superhero in Pittsburgh, a mild-mannered guy in a funny-looking van who goes around town striking happiness in the hearts of hundreds. If I can go out and help people and have them experience what love is just between neighbors, like, that's sweet. Where's 270? 29-year-old John Potter is a handyman by trade, but he doesn't charge for most of what he does. Do you mind starting it up? Whether it's a pizza delivery guy with no way to deliver, or an electric scooter guy awesome. with no way to scoot. Yeah. John is always to the rescue. Um, actually, let's throw it in the back. Like, just like a saint, pretty much. He like <laughs> He's willing to help anybody like, with whatever size problem you have. It might take me a day, honestly. John finds his rescuees on Reddit. People who have a window broken out, or can't afford the roof they need, or maybe just want help moving. John does it all for total strangers. That took a huge brain switch. He started uh, doing this four years ago after a woman approached him at this gas station. And she's like, hey, can I um, get a ride to the battered women's shelter or can I have money for the bus? And your answer? 
I said, no, sorry. It was a response he regretted almost immediately. Yeah, that haunted me right from the start. John vowed from that day forward he would say yes to anyone who asked for help no matter what they needed. And so far he's done about a thousand good deeds. Has he ever been scammed? He doesn't know. And quite frankly, he doesn't care. I give because I want to give, and that's just for me. And if anything, I go to bed and I feel happy. Yeah, come on in. Happy, but not wealthy. Is the check okay? Typically, John has just a few hundred dollars to his name, and yet he continues to give, sometimes a lot more than just handyman services. Um, would you mind carrying it to the car? After the kidney surgery, I can't lift anything. That's right. John has now moved on to vital organs. It's unbelievable. Last month, Michael Moore, another total stranger, got John's kidney. This is not fixing somebody's scooter. No, it's an unbelievable act of kindness. Michael says the best gift ever, but not only for the obvious reason. Because you find out that there's other people in the world that care, and uh, that's, a, that's a strong message. A message that John says is only going to get louder. I really want to give a piece of my liver. Are you joking? No. If the grave is home plate, I want to come sliding into it at this point, you know? Bare minimum <laughs> organs. I don't know, you might find me on uh, My Strange Addiction, like I'm addicted to giving organs. <laughs> addicted to helping others. There are certainly worse vices. Steve Hartman, On the Road, in Pittsburgh. All of us could use a similar addiction.